Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. Thank you, Lord, for your unfailing love. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, for loving us first, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have, given us all things the Bible says hallelujah 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 oh praise God I don't know if there's been anything the world's given me that I really needed amen, amen. and if the world gives it the world can take it away I read a little book the other day written by a multimillionaire. And uh, he was talking about his mentality of why he doesn't stop making money. And his reason for continually making money after having more money, and he said in his book that he could ever spend, he said he continually makes money because of just how fickle the economy is and how easily he knows that the money can fail. And so he is continually striving to have more and more and more and more out of fear. You know, if the world gives you everything you have, it can take it from you. But whatever God gives you, you'll never lose. I, I'm thankful for that. I'm never going to lose anything that the Lord has given me. Praise God. We're going to go to the Lord today. Good to see everyone in the house of the Lord today. Let's go to him in prayer, asking his blessings upon this day, every class. 
Is there a need in the house today, uplifted hand? You have a personal need, amen, or maybe standing today uh, in place of another. I got a text this morning. We haven't put it out yet on the prayer team, but uh, Brother Tom Simmons' mother passed away about 3 o'clock. But uh, she has gone on to be with the Lord. Amen. She was saved and ready for her reward. And so we're going to be praying for the Simmons family. God bless them. Amen. And other needs as well. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you on this Sunday morning to be in your house, to be together with people of like precious faith, to worship you in spirit and in truth. We've come today, God, just appreciating every good and perfect gift that you give us that you do not take away. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, your gifts are not fickle. They don't come and go easily from our lives, but they remain. And we pray today for this service and every class that the will of God would be done. Speak to us, everybody that has an ear. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Strengthen the Simmons family and all of the needs that are represented here in this auditorium today. God, heal those that are sick in body. Comfort those that are grieving. Strengthen the feeble knees. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. We're going to get one more chorus going. We'll dismiss our classes at this time. Amen. As we continue to worship the Lord today. No sweeter name than the, the name, name of, of Jesus. Jesus. No sweeter name have I have ever I known. known. No, no sweeter, sweeter name. name than the name of the Jesus. Name of Jesus. No sweeter name. Oh, no sweeter God. name than the name of there's no sweeter no name, no sweeter name I've ever, ever known. known. No sweeter name than the, the name, name of Jesus. Jesus. Thank God. For you, you are, are the light to my heart and my soul. You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and the broken. You are oh, hallelujah. The we just prayed for God to that meet way. needs, and He you is meeting needs today. To he sends the soul. light today. You are the light to oh, hallelujah, the hallelujah. He sends you the light. The he sends the, the hope. hope. Thank the you, Jesus. You are the You're the only truth. truth and the way. Oh, thank God, 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 thank God. Thank God, thank God. Thank God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With your Bibles in hand, let's turn to Ephesians chapter number one. Amen. You noticed when you walked in today that we are excited and anticipating vacation Bible school starting tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. There is a volunteer meeting immediately after service, uh, the second service. So you that are helping, you need to prepare uh, and plan to stay for that. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter number 1, verses 15 through 19. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer. And this is his prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance are in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Ephesians chapter 3, just look another page over, verses 8 through 11. This is Paul declaring how honored he felt to be a minister of the gospel. And he says, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship 
of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. This is some of the most lofty uh, scriptures of the New Testament. Paul does not mince words. He does not purposefully try to dumb this down. Even if you were reading this uh, in more of a contemporary version of the Bible today, it still reads um, uh, as uh, scripture that causes us to stop and meditate upon what is being said here. And I want to, by the help of the Lord today, uh, teach along these lines that from the context, verse 9, to make all men see. I think it's the job of the church to help all men see. Help us, Lord, today to see so that we can help others to see. Give us, I pray, vision. Help us to recognize, Lord God, who we truly are and who, Lord, you have called us to be and what the church is all about. I pray in Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. It's a little dark in here because we have the windows covered, and I miss that sunlight, although it's cloudy today. So I hope it doesn't create an ambiance of sleep for you, because I need you to, I need you to wade with me into the depths of this text. I am not presenting to you today a sermon, but rather a meditation. This has been something I have been reading over and over and meditating on. I don't think I could preach a sermon adequately from these verses of Scripture. Uh, I could preach a point here and a point there, but I don't believe anybody, any preacher, any teacher, I don't think any of us could thoroughly plumb the depths of what we have just looked at in these verses today. Um, it reminds me of what the psalmist said in Psalms 143 and verse number 5. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the works of thy hands. How many likes art? How many likes to go to art museums and walk around and look at the various pieces of art that's hanging in picture frames or sculptures that have been created by some of the most brilliant men and women upon the face of the earth. And if you really love art, you recognize that everybody might see the same picture or the same piece of art a little differently. It is a reflection typically of that person, how they end up seeing with their eyes. You see something based upon who you are, what you think, the level of your education and experience. Another person could be standing right next to you and maybe they haven't had near the experience that you've had with art or an understanding like you have of what the artist's intention was when they painted that particular painting or sculpted that particular item and they receive something out of it that thrills them but you see a little bit more that's what the psalmist said I muse on the work of thy hands I believe it's very important for us to think on God and think about the things that God has made 
to meditate upon his word, not just to read it. And you understand when I say the word meditation, I'm not talking about some kind of, you know, new age meditation that comes from some Eastern religion where, you know, they are calming themselves to look deeply within themselves. We don't want to look deep into ourselves. We want to look deeply into the Word of God. We, we want to look deeply into God. Amen. I don't like what I see when I look deeply into myself. I don't want to meditate as if I'm a God. But I muse on the works of His hand. And, and so today is going to be more of a meditation than a sermon. And uh, I've been kind of thinking about these things. A week ago, Friday night at about 11.30, my wife and I were jolted out of bed by the shrieking alarm that came on our phones. An artificial voice began to speak through our phones, and possibly you had one of these things happen also. Tornado warning, tornado warning. And um, shortly after we heard the siren and the voice, we did what most sane people do. We ran outside to look around to see if we could see a tornado. <laughs> Tornadoes are pretty awesome. Uh, sadly, a little town in Missouri, I guess last night or the yesterday, was pretty well decimated by tornado. It's a powerful, powerful thing. I hope to avoid encountering tornadoes. But, you know, they form when warm fronts and cold fronts collide. And the denser, colder air gets pushed over the warm air and it begins producing thunderstorms and then the warm air rises through the cold air causing an updraft and if you have a a fireplace how many's got a fireplace at home that you like to burn wood and uh, you realize that once you get a fire going in the fireplace that that air that heated air doesn't come into the room the smoke doesn't come into the room but it rises up through the chimney and that heated air rises warm air rises cold air tends to to settle and there's an updraft when these warm and cold fronts come together and uh, there's this updraft that begins to shoot from the ground up and if there's enough wind that is around it could get those spinning and rotating and then it can form a, a tornado. The forces of nature are extremely powerful. Often when we speak of the forces of nature, we reference what is known as the four natural forces of matter. These being wind, water, fire, and earth. You might remember that from science class. Wind, water, fire, and earth. And we can't see wind, but it's understood easily enough. We can see water. We can see fire. We can study the earth. These forces are more easily understood, and, and um, uh, we, we feel like we have a, a grasp of their effect upon us. But there are four more awesome powers affecting our world, and these you have to had a little bit more education than what you probably got in elementary school or at junior, uh, even junior high. Maybe you might have heard a little bit of it in high school, but colleges teach these four awesome powers that affect our earth. And they're even stretching the greatest scientific minds even today. The more we think we understand them the more we realize we don't. They write books about them, but then the books get obsolete. And even in 2023, much of what is taught about these four awesome powers is still speculation. Physics gives them the names of gravity, electromagnetism, and the nuclear forces, uh, both weak and strong. These forces are powerful, but they are invisible, yet they are responsible for holding everything in the universe together. All of these forces are necessary to keep the universe in its proper order. Gravity. We're familiar with gravity, although we can't really explain it too well. 
It is that uh, force of nature that attracts objects with mass or energy towards each other. It's the reason why objects fall to the ground. It's the reason why planets orbit around the stars. Amen. Uh, whenever Newton, I believe it was, was sitting under the apple tree and the apple fell and hit him on the head, it made him think, why? Why does an apple fall to the ground? And he studied that and he gave it the name of gravity. Electromagnetism, electricity is all around us. Not just because we have tapped it and learned how to use it to light the building, but even if we had never understood how to utilize it, there's so much electricity. Amen. Even your body right now, is, it, it, there's electrical impulses that is making your muscles of your heart contract. And if you have some kind of a, uh, of a sickness or a disease, you might have to have a pacemaker inside of your heart, uh, inside of your chest that, that will send an electric impulse to your heart muscle to make it contract and so forth. We, we're surrounded by electricity and we're surrounded by magnetism. And uh, these fields, the electric fields and the magnetic fields are in what's known as the ionosphere. And they interact with each other. We know very little really about them. Nuclear forces of weak and strong, these forces are found in the atom. The most basic building block of our universe. And uh, mankind has, has been able to study the atom uh, a little. Unfortunately, we've learned how to use it to split it and uh, how to get energy, that great nuclear energy that's found in atoms. We've learned how to utilize that and harness it for making of bombs and, and so forth. But these four forces, gravity, electromagnetic powers, nuclear, both weak and strong, if they were taken from our world today, we would die. Immediately, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't live. They, uh, they, they hold this world together according uh, to, to science. And God made these powers in the very beginning of creation. It's taken mankind uh, thousands of years to even come up with workable theories to define them. They're nothing to play with. They can destroy us if they are not handled respectfully. We've sort of harness their power. We've learned how to use gravity for our benefit, not only to fall, but, but how to rise. We've learned aerodynamics and, and the, the forces of such to be able to lift planes off of runways into the sky, and we have to be able to interact properly with, with gravity. We respect gravity, right? If you don't think you respect gravity, I've got a ladder we could set up. And we could let you climb up a ladder and see why all of a sudden your knees start feeling a little tingle in them when you look down. We know, we know about the forces uh, uh, of gravity. We've harnessed the atom and the nucleus of the atom to power our lives. And these forces are invisible. But yet through the wisdom of God and his... Um, his translations of such to the scientific community, we've been able to see the power of these forces. Let me take you into the Word of God. Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 20 speaks of these invisible realms. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse all right so at the very creation of the world there was invisible powers we've listed some of them and many more that we don't even know about today but yet the invisible things of God are seen by the things that are made what God has made testifies to us about him amen God is invisible, the Bible says. He's eternal, immortal. But we can learn about him through that which he has made manifest. 
what he has revealed to us. And all of this is so uh, awesome to us. Amen. That it testifies that there is no greater power than God. Amen. He's not one of multiple higher powers. He is God. Amen. Even his eternal power and Godhead is alone to be feared and reverenced. And everybody everywhere has had the privilege of encountering this revelation. And the Bible says there's no excuse. There's no excuse for the atheist. There's no excuse for anyone, amen, to be able to stand today and say, well, I, I have seen no evidence for God. Well, open your eyes. <laughs> Look around. Look up into the heavens. Look at the sun. Look at the stars. Look, look at the earth. Look through a microscope. Amen. And you'll see the handiwork of God all around. The study of apologetics in religion calls this the teleological argument for the existence of God. Amen. That, that this argument proves the existence of God based upon all of the evidence of order and design in nature. Amen. When you see something that has design to it, you realize that, that uh, it didn't just happen in some kind of uh, accidental manner, that there is a true design to that. Off the coast of Europe, about uh, uh, 50 feet down or so the other day, uh, they, they started, uh, after a big storm, some scuba divers started noticing on the uh, floor of the ocean there that there were patterns in it and, and uh, that these, these patterns continued on for 50 yards or so and they, they realized that what they were looking at was a road that at one time there had been a road of bricks there and those bricks were all laid out just like you would lay out a road and they, they didn't think they would encounter a road in the ocean but they had and they were able and they're studying it now to just see where that road went and why there's a road there and, and, and so forth. But they, they knew that that just didn't happen, that that wasn't some kind of design by nature, but rather a design that had come from the mind of a person and a, and a people. And when we behold the intricate design of creation, amen, it helps us to realize that evolution has no real standing at all. That chaos cannot, con cannot create this kind of order and, and so forth. And, and that there is a God behind all of this. And we, we call that the teleological argument for the existence of God. But 95% of the universe that you and I live in uh, has a force within it that's called dark energy. Dark energy. That's the name. That's the best name they could come up with. It's an energy that they cannot see. Therefore, they call it dark. It's not dark because it's somehow satanic or of the occult, but it's, an, it's a powerful energy that affects everything in the universe, but they cannot study it itself they only see the effects of this energy upon everything else how it impacts all other aspects uh, uh, of nature and and it is also according to what they the little they know about they, they, they see that it is somehow a bridge between the invisible realms and the, the visible realms of creation. It's a bridge. It, it impacts not only things that are invisible to us, but dark matter affects matter that, uh, dark energy affects matter that we can see, that we can recognize, that we can interact with. Amen. It's, it's, it's right now in this very room. It's affecting the pew that you're sitting on, real wooden pew, but it's also affecting things that are in the atmosphere here, the electromagnetic forces that are, that are in this. It's affected gravity that is all around us. It's affecting the atoms that, that are all around us and within us. Everything unified in this harmonious 
perfection and this dark energy is at work within them. I think it's awesome to to meditate upon these things. Again, I'm not trying to preach you a sermon today. I'm just trying to let you think about something maybe you haven't thought about for a while. What could this dark energy be that affects everything, both in the visible realms and in the invisible realms? Well, I I, I think we could look at the scripture again. Amen. I, I, I believe that we could see it in Colossians chapter number 1, verses 16 and 17, when the Bible says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. All things consist. Amen. By him. What's that mean? It means he holds it all together. That Jesus holds all of this universe together. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. This powerful invisible force that science calls dark energy not only holds our universe together, it holds it together in a perfect order. Which I believe that order and that design also reveals to us continually the greatness of God. Psalms 19 and 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. I don't know how many languages there are on the face of the earth. I don't know how many people groups there are on the face of the earth. But there is no speech or no language that has not heard or un- come to, to recognize what the Bible refers to in verse number 2 of Psalms 19, the speech of the day and the knowledge of the night. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. And everybody on the face of the earth encounters this, no matter who they are, where they live, Amen. And the Bible says their line has gone out through the whole earth and their words to the end of the world. And in them hath he even set a tabernacle for the sons. It's an amazing meditation to consider. What are these lines that go out? Amen. What is this tabernacle? This tabernacle of of the sun. It's more than poetic imagery. But God has used creation to witness to you and I. And no matter who we are, no matter what our language is, we have no excuse, amen, not to be raised to a place of awe and realize that something had to make all that there is. And so Paul begins now in Ephesians chapter number 1 where we took our text in verse number 15. I believe that Paul is is wading into these deep waters and he recognizes the need for his audience, his audience predominantly being Gentiles of which he is called and he says, Wherefore I also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints cease not to give thanks for you, then make mention of you in my prayer that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Amen. Paul was not a scientist. He was not trained in the science fields. They had no understanding in those days of of science as we have today, although they could understand that there was electrical magnetic forces in the world, that there was gravity, and, and, and they no, there's no way they could have understood the atom outside of just deep meditation. But he says, I'm praying for you. Amen. And I believe that this is a prayer we need to copy and pray for others. Everybody that you want to see saved, you ought to pray like Paul, that God would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. But where does this this wisdom and revelation come from? The Bible says it comes from the knowledge of him. All right? So the basis of all wisdom, the basis of all revelation is the knowledge of 
of Jesus Christ. It's centered in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Verse 18, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened and you may know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. All right? So all recognize today that this God is glorious and that his power, amen, is mighty. Hallelujah. Verse number 8 of chapter number 3, Paul then goes on. And he's speaking about how he is so blessed as one that he calls himself the least of the saints. I've been given a grace that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and Make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So God made all things by Jesus Christ. All right? It was by him, for him, through him. Amen. The word the Bible says, the plan of God, the logos of God, the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us, all of these things, hallelujah, have come to pass for the purpose of giving the highest, I believe, revelation of all. The greatest revelation of all is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. How did Paul see these things? How, 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 how does Paul even speak on this kind of level? I mean, how does he speak of the fellowship of the mystery? How does he speak uh, about things being created amen, by Jesus Christ? Well, I believe that he spoke this out of divine revelation. Divine revelation given to him by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit always testifies of the great power of Christ. Amen. Right. Amen. And he said, I want all men to see this. So before all men can see, you and I must see. There needs to be no doubt in our minds of how Amen. Creation came to be. We, we need to be aware. Hallelujah. Even if we can't explain it all. I, I, I need to settle the issue in my mind. There is a God in heaven. And that God created the earth. And that God created all that I will ever encounter. That God is God over all of this. He brought everything into existence. I have to see it even if I don't understand it. I see it in faith. Faith. I see it by divine revelation. I see it from reading the word of God. I see it by the anointing that is in my life through the power of the Holy Spirit. And not only must I see it, but I pray that all men will see it as well. I believe this divine revelation is accessible to all men as they place their faith. Everyone say faith. It is through faith that we begin to see and, and we walk. By faith, not by sight. The faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the author of our faith, isn't he? He is the beginning of our faith. It is, it is faith in Jesus Christ that causes this to have anything at all. If you have faith in a light bulb or if you have faith in a, in a dog, nothing. You're not going to be elevated. You're not going to rise to any place of understanding. That's why we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. And not one another. Amen. When we get our eyes off of Jesus and we get our eyes on man and we get our eyes on culture, we get our eyes on this world, it begins to lower us. Amen. It begins to make us less than. But when we keep our eyes on him, hallelujah, we get raised every day. We hear speech in the morning. We get knowledge in the night. Why? Because we have faith in him. Oh, praise God. And not only is the author of our faith, he's not only the one that will cause us to have faith and help us to see what that faith can do, but he's the finisher of the faith. Oh, that's the day that's coming, brothers and sisters. That's when all of this is going to be understood. Amen. The same faith that brought me this far is the same faith that's going to carry me over. And that's the faith that, that I'm going to have when I see it all clearly for the very first time. Oh, hallelujah. But let me tell you this about science. And, and, and I'm, I'm getting out of time. But if science doesn't align with God's eternal purpose of creation, here's the thing. 
Here's the thing about when science gets it wrong. When science gets it wrong, there are so many glaring inconsistencies. I believe that the universe is this, is this perfect order and everything in the universe fits. It's always going to fit. Every I is going to be dotted. Every T is going to be crossed. Everything, everything can be looked at from any direction. You can look at it north and south, east and west, diagonal. Everything perfectly harmonizes together in the universe. But when science makes its uh, uh, theories and hypotheses and they don't align with the eternal purpose for which God created the heavens and the earth, you see inconsistencies. You begin to say, well, that... Well, then, then that throws that off and that throws that off and that makes that don't fit anymore. I, 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 and, and there is oftentimes, a, a man, a desire within people. There's a desire within people to not acknowledge God, to not acknowledge his place over all creation. And so they will willingly allow themselves to live with these glaring inconsistencies. They will willingly submit Subject themselves to this that they want to say is true even though it don't fit when you look to the right and it don't fit when you look to the left. It, it, it's, it's totally out of context. Amen. And, and yet, yet they, they will receive that and they will want that to be true so much and, and they will believe the Bible says a, a lie. All advances to come in the realm of science will only strengthen our faith in Jesus and the validity of the Bible. If I ever improved that that is wrong, then you can just show me the door. Every advance that is in the realm of science that is true, it will strengthen your faith. And it will strengthen the validity, uh, your, your idea of the validity of the Bible. Amen. Because if it's not, if it doesn't strengthen our faith, if it doesn't strengthen the validity of the Bible, the Bible refers to that even as science so-called. And it will cause blindness instead of vision. And people that desire blindness do so because they desire to deny God. They desire to deny God, and so they try to find falsehood somewhere. They desire to deny God, so they try to find inconsistency somewhere. They desire to deny God, so they, they're looking every which way they can to try to see something that's out of order just a, a little bit so that they can throw the whole idea out the door and be left with nothing, of course. At that moment, then there's no rhyme or reason. There, that moment, there's, there, there's no purpose to anything. There's no reason to be right. There's no reason to live a certain way. There's no reason to honor your father and mother. There's no reason not to kill, steal, destroy. There's no reason. There's no, there, 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 there's, there's no judge at the end of time. There's, there's nobody looking over your life saying you're doing it inconsistently. You know, at that point, then all inconsistencies are on equal ground. On that point all truth is truth and everybody can believe what they want to believe no matter if your truth glaringly denies what their truth is that's the world that some people want but that's not the world they're going to find the world whenever they see as God wants us to see is going to be our father's world it's beautiful amen it's complete it's always consistent it's always glorifying God I believe the birds wake up in the morning and sing praises to the most high I believe the waves crash into the beaches every Every day testifying that there is a man, a God that is in the heavens that's high and lifted up. Oh, hallelujah. I believe there's a speech in the day and there's a knowledge in the night. And I always want to stay in tune with it. Because the day that I stop listening for the speech of the day, the time that I turn myself away from the day speech and the night knowledge is the time that I say I can become my own God. All truth is God's truth. And so everything that is true will lead you to God. You can be led to God from a 
proper study of science. You can be led to God through the proper study of mathematics. You can be led to God, amen, by all truth. Eventually, if they chase it and they study it, it'll take them to some invisible, eternal thing that has existed from every place, has existed from all of time and even prior to. So we must help men see. We must help men see. To the best of our ability, we must help them see that in creation, there is invisible and visible realms and there's a bridge between. And we must help them see that there is a negative force in the world called sin. I tell you, there's a force in the world. I believe that sin is just as powerful as gravity. I believe that sin is just as powerful as electromagnetism. I believe sin can do as much damage as an atom bomb. I believe that when sin is not addressed and when sin is not dealt with, sin brings death, the Bible says. And confusion and chaos reigned after mankind fell in the garden. But Jesus Christ came to reverse the sin problem. He came to fix sin. Amen. He came to make it right again. He came. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Sin thought he was in control. Death thought it was going to reign. But glory to God, Jesus Christ took sin and conquered it. He took death and he conquered it. Oh, praise God. And that's the gospel. And that's what the church has been given to preach. We preach the gospel that'll save people from sin today. Amen. We preach the gospel that'll save people from death today and bring life to them. We preach a gospel that'll open their understanding. 2 Corinthians 4 and 3. Even though the God of this world tries to blind the minds of them that believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ the image of God would shine into them and the church is shining today the gospel of Jesus Christ we preach about the power and wisdom of God in his church can I say this in closing as our musicians come and we prepare to pray there is a power and a wisdom of God in the church there is a power that by the church would be made known the manifold wisdom of God, Ephesians 3.10. And the eternal purpose, Ephesians 3.11, of God, which he purposed or brought to pass through Christ Jesus our Lord. These we only can meditate on. Someday we'll get greater revelation. But let me tell you this about the church. The true church. The church in its glory. The church flowing in the spirit as it ought to be. The church glorifies God upon the earth. And I believe that the church will bring more people to God than any other divine revelation. People can look at gravity and say, wow, that's a powerful force. God must have made that. People can look, they can look at electromagnet, electromagnetism and say that's a powerful thing. It influences everything and there must be a God. People can look at the, the atom and they can see the, the weak and the strong aspects of nuclear power and they can say, wow, yes, that's designed by a designer and that designer then must be intelligent and that designer must be God. But there is nothing, according to the scripture, that can reveal the greatness of God. Amen. Then the church. Amen. How? I don't, I don't know. We're just regular people. We just get together. We just try to do what we can do. We just pray and praise and we just love one another and we just try to make a difference. But God says, I have put more in you to reveal who I am than I did in the invisible realms of creation. I have made you to witness of me more than the sun and the stars and the wind and the earth and the water and the fire. You and I, you and I, when we are who we're called to be.
are greater than the greatest nuclear plant. More powerful than the force of gravity. And all men who maybe haven't seen it yet when they looked through a telescope. They didn't see it when they looked through a microscope. But when they looked at the church. Stand together with me today. Oh, hallelujah. I purposefully... Hey man, I, 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 could, I, I, had to, I had to just carry this a little further with your eyes closed. Oh, praise the Lord. Brother Andrew Gannon's going to come in just a moment. He's going to lead us in prayer. If you need to slip out, you can. But if you want, if you want to respond to this message, this altar's open right now. This altar's open right now. If you want, as I do, to meditate just a little bit more upon this great idea this grand idea that the church, the church is the highest revelation of God's power. Amen. That the church is the most awesome witness. Oh, hallelujah. The evidence of the church. Then we need to respond to this today. We need to respond to this today so that people may see, that people may see Oh, God, help us to see. Help us to see. We're just going to muse a little bit longer. We're just going to meditate a little bit more on this. We're just going to think about it because it's so mind-boggling to think that God's church, that God's church is so awesome and God's church is so powerful. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You're a part of it, brothers and sisters. We're a part of the church. I'm not just talking about this brick-and-mortar building. I'm talking about the whole body of Christ worldwide. We're a part of this great church this most awesome most glorious uh, most mighty amen nothing compares to it at all nothing nothing compares to it at all oh hallelujah hallelujah amen would you make your way forward as brother Gannon comes he's just just take the microphone brother Gannon and lead us begin to lead us in prayer